Okay, we're ready this, to start. Let's call this meeting to order. Uh, let's stand for the pledge, please. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to, the to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So now we'll have the budget presentation. Good evening. And tonight we're going to talk about the state aid runs that were released in January. They're typically considered the governor's runs. They're our first look at any anticipation of state aid for the 21-22 budget year. So this year, there are some categories that were on the state aid runs that I wanted to review with everyone so you understand what they are. There's foundation aid, which is the only unrestricted aid that a school district receives. And it is a result of a 2007-2008 lawsuit. And in 2008, 2009 school year, the implementation was halted because of an economic downturn and they have not yet fully implemented the formulas so that districts are receiving free and equitable state aid in order to give every student in New York State the same degree of education. This year we have something new which the governor tried last year and he's trying to combine some of our expense driven aids. We're gonna talk about those and he wants to categorize them as service aids. And then we have excess cost aid, which we'll talk about, building aid, the school tax relief program, because it's the first time it's shown up on the governor's aid runs, and a local district funding adjustment, which is the new gap elimination adjustment, the new GEA, because it works the same. So we're gonna look at our foundation aid. And if you look at the 18, 19 year, you see it was 7.2 million, and then it went up 83,000 in 1920 to 7.3 million, where it has stayed for 1920, 2021, and 21, 22. And remember, this is the aid that was not fully implemented. The formulas are not running, it's not fully set in. If the formulas were fully implemented for 2021, the school district would be receiving 8.1 million versus the 7.3 million. So right now, because that aid formula is not running correctly, we have a shortfall in our state aid of $780,000 or 5.14% of the tax levy. Service aids, they were expense driven aids last year. What they were for, I'm gonna go through line by line so that you can understand what they are and how they are occurring. So BOCES is the Board of Cooperative Services for School Districts. And in 2018-19, we were reimbursed for our 2017-18 expenses after the formula was run for $1.08 million. In 1920, we were reimbursed for 1819 expenditures for $1.3 million. 2021, that aid dipped from 1.3 million down to a little over a million. And our governor's runs are projecting a 1.082 million in BOCES aid. And if you look at the formula and the aid results, you'll see that we went from getting a million 88,000 in 1819 and in 21-22, we're only projecting 1.082 million. And the difference is not that we're using less BOCI services, it's that there are more excluded costs now than there were in the past. Hardware and technology aid are based on a formula based on our public enrollment for the prior year. And that public enrollment then is, has a factor applied to it to reduce it more. So, Hardware and technology was reimbursed in 1819 for 1718 expenses for 21,308. And I think that everybody can understand and see that when the governor gave us his runs for 2122, it was based on expenditures for 2021. Our software, library, and textbooks, we get aid, they're all based on our enrollment. 
for the prior year. So again, in 1819, we were reimbursed for 109,845 of 2017, 18 expenses. So what this means for these aides is that if we don't spend all the money that's in our aid report for these specific items, we just don't get it. So that went in 1920 up to 109,000, where it stayed pretty stable for 2021 and next year around 97,000. Transportation aid went from 1.2 to 1.4, down a little bit, and that was because of the full remote we had in the spring. And then 1.5 is next year's projection. So we are looking at our total service aids to go up from 2.5 in 1819, they went to 2.8. They dipped in 2021 to 2.6. And then we're looking at for 2122, if the formulas hold, they will go up to 2.7 million. Now I want to talk about the concerns I have over combining those expense driven aids to service aids. Every year we can predict based on what we spent in the prior year, what aid we will drive by running the formulas independently on our own to know where we're going to get revenue for our state aid runs. That helps make the state aid more predictable and it helps us to ensure that we can afford the things that are necessary to educate our students. Service aid might not increase if they treat it like they did the foundation aid, which we said was an act of a lawsuit and they didn't fully implement that. My concern is that service aid might be frozen and then we would not be getting increased aid back for things that are vital to our district. The most vital of all of those aids are our transportation aid because we need to bring the students to and from school. So because of the past practices in the state, I find this combination of the aids very concerning. Excess cost aid, what is that? <laughs> it's formula-based reimbursement for our special education students because state education understands that sometimes our special ed children need extraordinary services to be able to be properly educated. So there's a high cost excess aid and those are students who are educated in a public school or a BOCI. And then there's private excess cost aid, which sounds like, oh, they're going to a private school. They're going to places like Aspire or Summit which are non-for-profits that specialize in these students' needs. And some we are required by the regulations to send the students to the least restrictive environment. So we need to make sure these kids are getting everything that they need for services so they can grow just like all of our other students to be the most productive members of society possible. So our excess cost aid in 1819 was derived from 1718 expenditures. And that was at 169,000 for high cost, the public, and the private was 178,000. So now to fast forward to 2021, we were reimbursed at 216,000 and 211,000. And the governor is projecting based on the applications we've made for this aid this year, that we're gonna have 331,000 in excess cost aid and 227,000 in the private excess cost aid. Or is, is the governor's run for 21-22 or for? It's for 21-22, but I'm trying to show a history so hmm. people can understand the importance of the combination of the aids and how you can see it varies based on our expenditures, but we're able to predict it. So our building aid is when we go out for a capital project and we issue bonds and we have mortgage payments, the state reimburses us. It's their share of our mortgage payments. New York State pays 78.2% of all aidable capital project expenses for Eden Central School. So you can see that it's gone up just a hair in the 2021 year from 2,094 to a little over 2,400. 
So that's projected to go up based on our debt service schedule or our mortgage amortization schedule. So for the first time, we're seeing the school tax relief program, which is STAR, listed as a state aid, which is interesting because what happens is homeowners who applied for STAR and were eligible, they applied with the local assessor before 2015-16, get a credit on their tax bill for their individual portion of the school tax based on a formula. That credit dollar value was frozen in 2019 to the levels there. So where in the past, the star credit was based on our taxes and not allowed to increase more than 2%, it has been frozen for those receiving the credit. So those credits were paid in lump sum to the district. Now, in 2015-16, after 2015-16, New York State started to mail those checks to the individual property owners. And so this aid that is being phased out is now suddenly appearing on our state aid runs, which is concerning because it really has no direct ties to the current tax rates, student enrollment, or expenditures of the district. It is tied back to a 2019 benefit level. So the most concerning thing to come out of the budget from the governor's runs, local district funding adjustment with an offsetting federal CARES restoration. So what is happening is the governor looked at his checkbook and said, I don't have enough money. So I'm going to reduce what I'm paying to school districts by a formula that is similar. And this whole process is similar to the gap elimination adjustment that school districts went through in the past. What happens is the governor is saying, if I get a one-time restoration from the federal government in stimulus money, CARES funding, I will pay that directly to the school districts. And that is wonderful, but historically, state aid is not reinstated by the state when the federal funding ends. So the elimination of gap elimination adjustment, when the federal stimulus money went away, there was no state aid to replace it and it took us years to get those fundings back. So it has a potential harmful impact in the current year and in future budgets. So school districts, the local funding Adjustment for Eden was $1,220,000 or 8% of the 2021 levy. Now I'm gonna put it all together. So our 2021 actual state aid, excluding the star that was added for the first time this year was 12,546,000. Our proposed aid excluding the star is 12,833,000 or a 287,000 or 2.3% increase. And that is in anticipating that in fact, the federal government will provide New York State with stimulus funding. Are there any questions on the state aid? Or did, I can't remember, did we discuss the last time why you think he's including the star in the budget run? I'm not certain, except for to know that when the star is included, my fear is he's taking credit for giving us more tax dollars that he will cut somewhere else. Mm. Okay. Uh, in, the, in the meetings and discussions I've had uh, with superintendents and, and the different seminars, there really, uh, there really isn't a known rationale for why he's doing that. It, it came out of left field. Any other questions? Now we're gonna move on to the property tax cap calculation. These are riveting <laughs> things. So we're gonna talk about the terminology so that you understand what it is. We're gonna talk about what a capital exclusion is. We're gonna look at the line by line calculation so everyone is aware that when I say it's not a simple answer, 
when something changes, everyone will understand. We're gonna look at the tax levy threshold and what it means. And then at the end of the presentation, the board is going to be asked to give me a preliminary decision on whether or not they want to exceed the tax cap. So I'm forewarning you just like every other year where we get to the end and I feel like I've blindsided everyone. I need an answer for my March 1st deadline. So we have a tax-based growth factor that is provided to the school district from the Office of Real Property. They look to see what new buildings and what new growth have occurred in our community. So in 21-22 for our calculation, it's 0 0.0042. So that's not even a half percent of interest, of increase. So that's all the new houses, any new additions. It's not considering a remodel or a reassessment. These are new builds. Then we have an allowable levy growth factor, which is provided every year from the New York State Comptroller's Office. This is the average CPI index. This year it's 1.23%. The maximum it can ever be under the tax cap formula is 2%. This year is below the state maximum. So now there's something called pilot payments, which are payments in lieu of taxes, which are negotiated through the Erie County Industrial Development Agency. And what it does is it takes a property tax for a new business and it starts it off low and then it gradually moves it up in 10 years to be fully taxed on the tax rolls. Currently, Eden does not have any pilots. Then there would be available carryover if we did not use all of our levy, potential levy increase before exclusions in the prior year. So this year we have no available carryover. So our capital exclusion from last year was $204,693. Our capital exclusion, which is our debt service payments, less our state aid, so it's the local share of our projects, is $133,797. And that will be very crystal clear why that's important to see that that's being reduced. So you start out with the, you multiply last year's levy times the growth factor which gives us $50,228,519. And then we reduce it by last year's capital exclusion to get us an adjusted prior year levy of $15,023,826. So we take that adjusted prior year levy and then we apply the growth factor of 1.23% which gets us to $15,208,619, a mere less, little less than $5,000 increase yeah. for the. Then we go through and now we add back this year's capital, the local share of the levy, which is $133,797, which gets us to our total maximum levy limit under the tax cap is $15,342,416. In other words, we're allowed to increase our levy by $177,589 or 1.2% of the 2020-21 levy. Any questions? So now, as promised, I need to be able to check a box when I submit my tax cap on March 1st. And I simply need to say, at this time, is the Board of Education thinking that they're going to stay at the 1.2% or try to levy at a higher percent? The ramification of that is if we go to a higher percent, we need a 60% supermajority versus if we stay at the 1.2 cap, we need to get 50% plus one. So this is the part where I'm kind of looking for some feedback from the board. I would offer my opinion to say that given COVID and challenges that many families are facing, 
Um, now is not the time, even though 1.2% is not the 2%, I don't believe now is the time to uh, exceed the tax cap. Well, we just had a successful capital project vote. I think I think the 1.2 is restrictive, but, but I think we'll have to find a way to deal with it. I agree, I, I agree with Jack. Yeah, we both agree with Jack, yeah. I agree with Jack. Laura, we, what did we go out last year at? We could have gone out at 2.1, we went out at two. I believe so. And then it got passed at one eight one seven something like that. Yes. One eight one eight two. Okay. Um, I, I agree with with everybody else. I think we should uh, stick to the formula of the of the one point two percent growth. Um, I know last year uh, the Boston section of of the Eden School District actually got a tax reduction because they had um, substantial growth compared to the rest of uh, the Eden District. <clears throat> um, and I say, let's go out at the 1.2% and see where the, uh, the equalization rates fall for everybody in the community then. I agree. Thank you very much. So that is due to the New York State Office of State Controller by March 1st. And I will submit that tax cap in time for the deadline. And now I just wanna remind everyone of our budget calendar going forward because things are a little different this year. We're not having quite so many meetings and presentations due to the pandemic. So on March 1st is when I will submit the tax cap and it will be to New York State by then. March 17th will be a Board of Education meeting and we will focus on expenditures at that time. March 24th will be a budget workshop where we'll look at possible scenarios as we're trying to predict what will happen on the March 31st deadline for the adoption of the state budget. And once that's adopted, we typically receive our legislative runs. April 20th is our tentative budget adoption date with the New York State tax report card due on April 21st. May 4th is our public hearing and May 18th is the budget vote. And we're anticipating that to be at the middle school, high school, auditorium entrance from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. as per usual. Thank you very much. Do we have a request to withdraw specific items from the consent agenda? All right, so we go to B. Um, that upon the recommendation of the superintendent, the consensus items be approved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstained? Motion carried. This is the approximate position <clears throat> and time that the board has designated to receive statements from individuals and groups. The board will review all statements, then respond appropriately at a future meeting. All persons in attendance are required to sign the attendance sheet and designate their representation status. For example, parent, teacher, bus driver, chamber of commerce, et cetera. There's a two minute time limit. Did we have any emails, Barb? Anything? I did not. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to address the board? There is not. All right, thank you. New business resignations that upon the recommendation of the superintendent, the resignation for the purpose of retirement of physics teacher Edward Myers be accepted effective July 1st, 2021. The board and administration wish to thank Mr. Myers for his 30 years of service to the district. Second. Any discussion? Uh, Don, just a quick uh, statement. Um, I have three sons who had Mr. Meyer. Uh, uh, he teaches physics for those who don't know. I'm, I'm guessing he teaches other things, but I know him through teaching mm -hmm. physics. Uh, one is an engineer, one is on, one of my sons is on his way to being an engineer. And when I mentioned that uh, Mr. Myers was retiring, when I read uh, that he was uh, uh, in the agenda, uh, one of my sons commented that he was the best teacher ever, which uh. certainly high praise. Um, I'm, I'm not a teacher, but if I were a teacher, I would hope my mission would be to uh, challenge and inspire uh, students to learn throughout their life. And, and I think uh, Mr. Meyer certainly accomplished that. 
Um, <clears throat> hope he enjoys his retirement and Eden was a better place while he was a part of us. So good luck to him in retirement. Jack, well said. Um, I know there's a bunch of senior girls that are uh, sad to see him leave as well too. And I, I think they're gonna actually gonna send an invite to hopefully a in-person graduation um, for Mr. Myers as well too. So I know that's kind of happening in the background and uh, he will be missed. So Mr. Myers, good luck on your retirement. Um, any other discussion? Mm -mm. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstained? Motion carried. That upon the recommendation of the superintendent, the resignation for the purpose of retirement of social studies teacher, Linda Pace, be accepted effective July 1st, 2021. The board and administration wish to thank Mrs. Pace for her 26 years of service to the district. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstained? Motion carried. That upon the recommendation of the superintendent, the resignation for the purpose of retirement of music teacher Denise Ullman be accepted, accepted effective July 1st, 2021. The board and administration wish to thank Mrs. Ullman for her 25 years of service to the district. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstained? Motion carried. That upon the recommendation of the superintendent, the resignation for the purpose of retirement of clerk typist Mary Hare be accepted effective March 30th, 2021. The board and administration wish to thank Mrs. Hare for her 17 and a half years of service to the district. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstained? Motion carried. New business appointments. Go to Bliss. That upon the recommendation of the superintendent, after successfully completing his probationary period, Chad Bliss be permanently appointed as director of facilities effective February 6, 2021. Second. Any discussion? So it's tough to believe Chad's only been here six months. <laughs> Seems like we just hired him. Uh, we did, yeah. True. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstained? Motion carried. That upon the recommendation of the superintendent, after successfully completing her probationary period, Tracy Kehoe be permanently appointed as a teacher aide effective March 8th, 2021. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstained? Motion carried. That upon the recommendation of the superintendent, after successfully completing her probationary period, Kathleen McKinnon be permanently appointed as a registered professional nurse, effective March 8th, 2021. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstained? Motion carried. That upon the recommendation of the superintendent, Joshua Bugenhagen be appointed on probation as a bus mechanic effective February 16th, 2021 and ending August 15th, 2021. Salary is based upon CSEA contract level 11, step one. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstained? Motion carried. That upon the recommendation of the superintendent, a refund of $624.36 be paid to the property owner of tax bill number 009058 due to an assessment reduction from $414,600 to $386,000 by the Small Claims Assessment Review Hearing Officer. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 
Any opposed? Any abstained? Motion carried. That upon the recommendation of the superintendent, the 2021 2022 school calendar be approved. Second. Any discussion? If I may, uh, Mr. Sutton, I'd just like to add a few words about the process that we undertook this year. Um, it was a real team approach, and I just want to thank uh, the leadership of the ETA, CSEA, and the EASA for their input and assistance in development of the 2021-22 calendar. It is important to note that the ETA expressed a willingness to enter into an MOA with the district in order for our school year to commence prior to Labor Day. Um, that is something they agreed to this current school year, wow. and we agreed to do that again for next school year. I absolutely appreciate, appreciate their flexibility uh, in that area. Uh, that flexibility allowed us to put together a calendar that allows our students to start uh, at the same time as their peers in other school districts uh, throughout Area 1 and Area 2. Keeps us fairly closely in line with the Western New York Regional Calendar and also gives the appropriate breaks that um, I think um, we've started to become accustomed to uh, in this district. So much appreciation for all involved. Yeah, it's, it's nice to be able to... Um you know, start uh, right after Labor Day with Labor Day being so late in the uh, September calendar. Um, and hopefully it's uh, full five days a week uh, next year and back to normal. So uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstained? Motion carried. Business report? Good evening. So we're going to talk about the 20% reduction we've been hearing about for state aid for the 2021 <clears throat> school year. And in that process, New York State has withheld from our district $242,348 for 1920 universal pre-K funding, BOCES aid, excess cost aid, and summer handicap aid for 2018-19 and 2019-20 in addition to 2021 universal pre-K payment. I am pleased to announce that SED has been told that we will be receiving those funds, but they're waiting for the Department of Budget to approve a timeline for distribution. No timeline has been sent at this point. In addition, we are still having issues receiving all of our federal and state school lunch reimbursements for the month of September, there was a hiccup in the system and we're still waiting for $18,138. That is not tied to a Department of Budget release. It is just New York State trying to catch up on some of the things that got behind due to the implementation of free school lunches for all children. And that's all I have for this evening. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Superintendent's report. Okay, so I, I'm going to talk to you a little, for a little bit about um, uh, the topic that always comes up when, when it's my turn to, uh, to report, and that's the work of our implementation teams. Um, you know, and their, their work started out really as trying to take our district level plan and determine how we could implement all of those guidelines and, and needs on a day to day basis. And they did a fantastic job um, and continue to do so. Our implementation teams, and again, we have one in each building. Uh, their focus now is determining if and how we can return students to our schools more frequently while still meeting all the safety guidelines. And there really hasn't been any change in safety guidelines, even though we've seen improvements in infection rates. We did an outstanding job in this district at, at our on-campus testing um, with one positive test out over 290 tests at 0.004% rate or something to that effect. Um, but there still hasn't been any, any change in the state guidance uh, in terms of what we can do in our buildings. And as you know, each of our buildings is different. They have different classroom capacities and different enrollments. And that plays a role in what we'll be able to do going forward. Currently, space is our big, biggest obstacle. And what I mean by that is the size of some of our classrooms. Okay? In two of our three buildings, we don't have enough classroom space uh, to increase in-person learning while maintaining six feet of social distancing. That's still a requirement. Um, I can tell you that superintendents and teachers and everyone who's looking at this 
knows that if that gets, if we get some level of flexibility with the six feet of social distancing, we can do a lot more. Um, Eden, and particularly at our primary and elementary building, um, we, we have added measures where our students are, are wearing masks almost all the time, uh, and we have barriers, and we're six feet socially distanced. Um, if those other factors, are, are the mask wearing, the face covering wearing, and the barriers were taken into account, and we could shorten the distance between children, we'd be able to bring more kids back. Our primary building, GLP, might might be able to return more students on a near daily basis. We're still working on that. I don't want to get anyone's hopes up too much, um, but we, we keep kind of picking away at some of those obstacles that we have. So there's significant work that ne needs to be done. Um, and, and part of the reason that we're able to do that is our overall capacity in all of our buildings is reduced somewhat by the number of students we have on, on a full remote schedule. Okay? So we're, we are looking at our capacity with our current hybrid students only. Um, we know unequivocally if all students came back um, under current guidelines, we wouldn't be able to have this conversation. It, it, would, be, it would be a moot point because we simply don't have that capacity. Um, so we continue to look at, at our classroom capacities, what we can do in the spaces we have, what, what furniture we might need, what, um, um, whether we need additional staffing or not. And again, that's, that's primarily the work of the implementation team. One of the areas that we have no internal solution for is busing. We know, again, unequivocally, that we do not have the bus capacity to, to transport all of our students. Um, and let's just say, let's, let's talk for, for instance here, and I'm going out on a limb, and if someone just jumps into the meeting right now, they might get really exciting, excited because they didn't hear how I, how I started, that there's a lot more work to do. But just to give you an example, if we answer all the questions that we still have about, and we'll just talk about GLP at this point, and we figure out lunch, and we figure out phys ed, and we figure out restroom breaks, and we figure out uh, classroom space, maintaining six feet of social distancing, and so on and so forth. And again, only focusing on the students who are currently in our hybrid model. We know we can't bus all those kids to school because the busing requirements haven't changed. And we, and, and we do not have the capacity to do multiple runs to get students to GLP in a timely fashion. When we looked at it early in the, in the school year, in the fall, or in the summer, I should say, um, it was determined that in order to do multiple runs to get all kids to school, we wouldn't be able to start school until about 10 in the morning. Well, that doesn't make any sense, okay? Um, so we may need, need some assistance from our community we, um, um, Mrs. Carter and I have talked about the need to get some feedback from uh, our GLP families uh, about transportation, and that will uh, be forthcoming when we answer some more questions. So really what we need to do is continue to look at our classroom space and continue to look at some of those other questions that I threw out there are already to determine if this is feasible or not. And when we get those questions, then we're going to go out to the community and say, are you willing and are you, are you able to drive? Um, and the reason I bring that up is there are some schools that have had some success, but they've only had that success because a good percentage of their families had the ability and the means and the willingness to, uh, to drive their students to and from school. Um, so I, I share that with you because it is a slow process. It was a uh, we, we were required to move very quickly to develop plans to return to school, and we did. And, and you would hope that we could move as quickly to, to return more, more students, but the restrictions in, in regards to the health and safety requirements are really prohibitive there. Um, and I, it's, it's been a great thought exercise uh, for our teachers and our implementation teams and all the folks that are, are part of that work. Um, I know there's a lot, a lot of frustration on their part. When I ask for some feedback from our, our principals, they know that, um, that the hybrid model has its limitations. Um, we're seeing that our students are not, um, you know, their performance today isn't as strong as it was earlier in the year. Uh, you know, there's some fatigue there on our students' part, which is not a surprise. Any school year, you're going to get a level of fatigue. Um, and, you know, we need to keep being creative and trying to refresh our processes as much as we can. Um, 
and towards that ultimate goal of, of bringing children back to school. Um, at, uh, at this point, is there, are there any questions from, from the board about you know, return to school plans or any, anything that you've been thinking about? Yes, I, I, I know with um, my son's children, my grandchildren that are in Connecticut, their school for the, um, it would be similar to the GLP, they, they have two sessions every day. They have, you know, they have a shortened day for each session, but let's say the first session goes eight to 11.30 and the next one goes one to 4.30 and all the students similar to GLP are in school every day for, th for three and a half hours, which would, you know, has anyone thought of that as a possible solution? That is that is one of the solutions that is being examined. And thank you for, for jogging my memory. That was in my notes and I skipped over those lines, Helen, so I appreciate that. Um, and, and in order to get to that model, um, we would have to do some community outreach as well. There, there's pros and cons with that model for sure. Um, being able to see children every day is certainly a, a positive component of it. Uh, you, um, There are some local districts that are following that model and have been following that model. I know um, a, a district to the south of here is adopting that model for one of their buildings and another building is, is coming back in, in, in flow because they have the capacity to do so. Um, but, but yes, that is a possibility as well. Yeah, I, I can just tell you for um, my two grandchildren there who are in uh, second and third grade, you know, they're, they're very happy. It's working well. And I mean, I, I think we all agree that seeing the kids every day, even if the day is a, a little shortened, I, I think has a lot of benefits. Yeah, it could. There, 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 are, some, there are some issues that we would need to iron out for sure. Um, don't forget, we have a lot of shared staff between our buildings um, to a very high level. Uh, so that there would be some impact there for uh, for certain. You know, I, I can't expect the teacher to be at GLP in the in the morning and the afternoon when they also have assignments at at the elementary or or, or one of the other buildings. Um, oh. Yeah, and I know. I mean, so it, the devil's in the details, and and those are the things that we need to be ironed out, um, of course. And the other piece too is um, our families have been in this model for a while. They've assumingly adjusted their their home lives and schedules and in, in, in child care. Um, it, we would need to do some outreach to determine, it, you know, if there's a critical mass of families that that could adjust to either a morning or, or an afternoon program. Other questions? Okay. So to continue on, then um, we at, we are returning to a, le a level of normalcy. Uh, which is exciting. And, um, you know, last night I, I uh, Mr. Iwanko and I attended the girls basketball season opener. And I, I can tell you personally, I was not going to let that game go on without at least one fan in, in the gymnasium. <laughs> so I was happy that there was a second fan there as well. Um, you know, both teams were so excited to be on the court. And, and the, these, these young athletes were just working so hard um, back and forth, you know, the score really was secondary. It certainly was, was in Eden's favor, which is, which is neither here nor there. Um, and, and, and of course, right now, fans are not permitted to attend games. Um, that's going to be revisited, I believe, on February 22nd. Um, and, you know, Mr. Iwanko and I have, and I have had conversations about that. Um, and we're hopeful that there, that the section comes to an agreement in, in, in allows uh, at least, at least a, a fan or two to attend for each athlete. Um, I believe this may have been mentioned before the, the meeting, but we do have a li live stream service through NFHS network that allows families and fans to watch games in our gym uh, and local hockey rinks. Um, last yeah. evening, we had, um, <laughs> we had over 500 online viewers. So that, that's was, pretty neat. And it was great because I, I don't know if you know, Jeff, you can, you can actually move it and you can watch it on a if you have a large tv you can watch it on a large tv it was really excellent yeah and i, I uh mr iwanko had the feed pulled up on his phone i was impressed with the quality of it and the, yeah. and the, the camera seemed to really follow the action it was pretty neat it was very good yeah. well i i know there's a slight fee to it and if you want to think of it this way <clears throat> and, and jack's not going to like this but it's uh <laughs> it, it's 
So you're just not spending the extra five dollars at the concession stand or <laughs> in the vending machine or, or whatever. So um, I, uh, I I attended a couple uh, hockey games this weekend via online, and Alan, I did the same thing: plugged the computer into the the big TV and and watched um, some uh, some amateur hockey this weekend. And my daughter's like, "Well, it's nine dollars for this," and I'm like, "Well." It would have cost me twelve dollars at Tim Hortons on the way there, and, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. and probably sure. lunch on, on lunch on the way home. So um, there's a slight fee, but the 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 videos is, are, has been pretty phenomenal. Um, I haven't seen Eden's yet, but just from what I've seen on, on some of the other ones, um, if you want to catch some sports, uh, it's out there. So um, in, in continuing on with the return to normalcy. Um, when the the state came through and said that we we can um, restart our high risk sports and in our case it's uh, it's basketball and of course we have bowling going on and, and boy swimming um, there was a lot of outreach from uh, teachers advisors and principals about what well, what about after school activities what can we do there and we're starting to bring those back as well okay um, and and I'm I'm happy for it our high school musical uh, is is moving forward. Um, the um, administrative team is working with advisors to make sure that all the health and safety protocols are, are in place. And you're, we're going to start seeing some, some increase in, in after school activity and, and a little bit more normalcy for our, our students. And that's on all levels. That's the primary building, the elementary building and the middle school, high school as well. Um, so I'm, I'm appreciative of how creative they've been to work, work virtually and how uh, committed our students and staff are going to be uh, moving forward to make sure some of those memorable activities can go on at, go on in schools. Jeff, I, I have a question that, that, because you made a good point about you know parents getting used to the and making babysit arrangements. Is the state willing to to lower that six feet if we encapsulated each of the desks in you know in plexiglass all around? Would they be more lenient with the six foot spacing? They haven't been so far, um, so I, I don't know. I can't answer that. I, I, I can tell you, Alan, that, um, that every major change that has happened, we can use the, uh, the, the restart of high-risk sports, has happened uh, in the course of a press conference, and, I've had, and, and no one, including Departments of Health, has had any prior knowledge of that, of that happening, as far as I know. I can tell you from the superintendent standpoint, we had no prior knowledge. So, um, you know, sometimes these, these changes ha happen in a, in, a, in a quick manner. And I understand that there's an, there's an awful lot that goes on at, at high level, levels of leadership. And, you know, we're in, in a very different environment than we've ever been in. So as long as the decisions that are made are positive for our students, we'll find a way to, to get them enacted as fast as possible. Let me put it this way. If they came out tomorrow and said, um, you, children can be uh, within three feet, after after February break, we'd we'd be back, um, but I don't expect that to happen. Could we fit everybody if they were within three feet? Could we fit everybody in the class? Yeah. Wow. I mean, they were within three feet before. So um, I and I use that as just an example of we we will be very prepared to pivot um, if that if any of those changes are made, just like we were prepared to pivot to go full remote and then and also to develop an on-campus testing program. So it, you, you're helping me reiterate my point earlier is we want to do more, we're ready to do more. And as soon as we're able to, based on the guidelines, we will. Alan, too, uh, I was gonna bring this up in the uh, the board report, but uh, I think uh, Mr. Torticio doesn't like uh, me catching <laughs> the governor's 1130 uh, press conferences. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I tend to read into a couple of them. So the other day I texted Jeff saying, um, hey, can we have graduation now since they're allowing weddings of 150,000 yes. or 150 people, you know, provided testing? And then what does the governor announce today that all major venues are allowed open at 10% capacity? <clears throat> so two questions I had for Jeff was, how many more of those rapid tests do we still have left? When do they expire? And can we use those 134 days from now when the class of 2021 graduates? <clears throat> and then what's the capacity of the, the turf field? Um, so 
hoping his 10% is going to go to 20 or 25%. And then the ultimate goal would be, you know, hopefully to have graduation outdoors um, at the turf field, provided everybody had their COVID test three days prior. Just reading what the you governor's let, been doing. You let 7,000 fans go to the Bills game that they all got tested. Why couldn't we do the same? So as of, as of tonight, the 23rd of this month, I think people will be able to attend the Sabres game. 10%. Really? Yep. Yeah, so wow. about 2,000 people might be able to go to the Sabres game. <clears throat> that's what's that's what's being kind of read between the tea leaves. But, you know, to, De to Jeff's point, the, the devil's in the details. So... The Sabres are all going to be sick and the coach, but the fans can go. They all came down. They said, <laughs> Cheryl's well, they, right. Yeah, yeah, they have nobody on their team right now. You could suit up, Don. No, I'm done. I, you know, I've been on the ice with Don, and I don't think either of us are going to suit up for the Sabres anytime soon. <laughs> now, Nancy maybe, but not Don or me. That's not going to happen. Um, Anyway, last thing I have, I just wanted to let you know that there was a, a Zoom conference call with Senator, Senator Galvin uh, back at the end of January. And I, I just want to share with the board and the community how, appreciative, how, how much I appreciate what a champion he is for education. Um, he took time out of his day to talk with all the, super, uh, all the superintendents in the areas that he represents and wanted to hear from us about how things were going and what could be better. Um, he certainly is, is a champion of a smart approach to funding uh, education. Um, and, you know, I think what we'll, what we'll see from the legislature as our final budget run is, is, is going to be positive as compared to what we currently know. Um, so just to, just to reiterate, we already know, Senator, Senator Galvin is certainly a friend of the Eden School District and, and I very much appreciate his work. That's all I have. Okay, thank you. Student report? Hi. Uh, so I don't have much, um, but what I did want to start off with covering was the Winter Spirit Week that uh, the Student Council uh, planned. Uh, it's been going uh, really well. We're halfway through Monday, Tuesday. Uh, there was some really great participation for the dress up days. Uh, you know, uh, all the students uh, really enjoyed seeing the hollies decorated and whatnot. And it was just, it was a nice escape from the kind of the, the emotions we've been going through and just and just waiting for more and more to open up to us because you know at this point in February we're we're itching to get back to that. So when high risk sports were announced and then um, we we're able to do the Spirit Week, uh, you know, uh, we're all really excited for that change of pace uh, and inching towards a normalcy. So went really well, um, great participation, and looking forward to what Thursday and uh, Friday look forward for that. Um, and uh, other than that, um, that's really all I have. So Caleb, we've got the musical in a little over three weeks. Wow. Uh, yeah, we'll be, um, right now we're having rehearsals after school and um, we are filming in a couple of weeks. And then by the time mid-April comes around, uh, my dad would have edited it all together to release to the public. So, uh, but yeah, it's really three weeks. Well, we have to have everything together for, so it'll be uh, quite the grind, but um, I mean, we're all really dedicated right now. We're all really, just blessed to be able to be able to do this. Good to hear. Yeah. All right, board report, round table. I just wanted to say congratulations to all the new retirees. I know uh, Georgia was pretty sad to hear that Mrs. Ullman was retiring. She is sweetheart of a human being and a wonderful music instructor to all the string, early string students. So that'll be a, a loss for Eden, but we wish her well and good for them. I'm happy for them and nice big step. <clears throat> good to see um, the sports back, the, the musical uh, coming yeah. aboard, um, you know, like, Jeff, Jeff pointed out a, a sense of normalcy is, is, is slowly getting here. Um, I don't know if it's going to get here fast enough, but uh, <clears throat> just thanks for everybody that, uh, you know, basically had a, you know, turn on a dime to get the high risk sports up and running um, all but wrestling at this point in time. And uh, I know at, at some point in time, Jeff, there's going to be something that's going to be brought up on the 22nd about having spectators. Um, <clears throat> I happen to be down in Pennsylvania the last day and a half. 
and talking to a bunch of my customers down there, uh, how Pennsylvania is doing a lot of things in regards to um, uh, people in the stands. A lot of times, like for instance, if, if Eden had the girls home game, they would allow two of the Eden parents in, no away parents. Um, so it, it, it's, it seems to work out pretty well, you know, trying to maintain and, and keep, you know, us together per se. Um, I think if we can get at least get to that level of um, uh, involvement for some spectators, I think that would be great. Yeah, Jeff, you've done a, the school's done a great job of uh, keeping all, all the COVID so low. We, we should get some recognition for that. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, anybody else? Well then, future dates, budget presentation and regular board meeting, Board of Education meeting, March 17th, 2021 at 7 p.m. in the Eden Elementary School Auditorium. BOCES annual meeting, Wednesday, April 14th, 2021, location to be announced. Regular Board of Education meeting and BOCES component vote data, vote date election of BOCES BOE members, Tuesday, April 20th, 2021. And now that upon the recommendation of the superintendent, the Board of Education enter exe executive session at what time? 8 p.m. exactly. 8 yes. p.m. to discuss the employment history of a particular person or persons. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Motion carried.